Hello everyone. Welcome to uh, this installment of the Voice of the Bride webinar. I think it's number 65. <laughs> Hard to believe we've done that many. And uh, we're going to continue our study on the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation chapter 2. Probably one of my favorite sections of the book of Revelation. I've always been kind of partial to the blessing uh, to those that overcome in the Pergamum church age. For some reason, it's just always been a, an object of fascination to me, something I've been on a quest for, and that is to eat of the hidden manna. And uh, I think one of the reasons I like that, to him that overcomes, it says, I'll grant to eat of the hidden manna, and I'll give him a white stone with a new name written upon it, which no man knows, save him that receives it. And the reason I think I like the, white, the, the hidden manna is because you have to go behind the veil to get it. Beyond the Veil. That's what I'm calling this series tonight, Beyond the Veil. <clears throat> we're going to talk about some other things first. Of course, we're going to talk about, uh, just to give you a little bit of a, of a forecast of what we're going to do, we're going to talk about Constantine just a little bit. We're going to focus on the church age. You know, in the last webinar, I talked a good bit about uh, the church of Pergamum, the one of the first century and the, the synagogues of Satan and all of that. And I won't go back into that. But we're going to pick up with Constantine and talk about the birth of Mystery Babylon. But before I do that, I just want to say again how much we appreciate the feedback we get from you. I read all the emails and I've got a few questions here that I'm going to do my, do my best to answer at the end. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate uh, your input and people send their dreams and stuff. I, I read them. It's just very hard to respond to, to very many. Uh, but I do appreciate the feedback because it gives me a little bit of a pulse of how well things are being communicated, what I might need to emphasize more or less, etc. And I just want to say, I'm just so blessed by the people that follow our ministry. I really am. I mean, I mean that sincerely. 99% uh, of all the emails that I get are very positive, faith-filled, mature people, uh, that have good things to say, even if they don't, uh, you know, one, one or here questioned something I taught last time, but he did it in such a wonderful way. I'm going to address it. I, I'm, I can appreciate that. And I just, I, I value the maturity of the people that follow our ministry and those that watch these webinars and the love, the love that comes from you because I get such kind emails. I, I got to be honest, when I went through my surgery back in March, the, the expressions of love were overwhelming. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails and letters and cards that were incredibly loving and kind. And for that matter, I just want to tell you also how much we appreciate the support. You know, I don't like to talk much about support, but, uh, you know, last year I did three meetings for the entire year, three meetings for the entire year. And yet our budget was met every single month, purely by the goodness of God and the love of you, his people. So thank you for that. Thank you for helping us do what we do. In fact, we not only made budget, we bought some new equipment that I hope improves the quality of what we're doing. So thank you for sowing into what we're doing. I pray that it's uh, an abundant blessing back to you and that God richly restores and replaces and amplifies everything that, he, that you've given in a, in a great way. Amen. And we have, we have thousands of people that watch, so you're doing something like a missionary offering. So anyway, amen. Let's just dig right into it. We're going to go right into the church of Pergamon. We're going to fo focus primarily on the church that, uh, the, the Pergamum church age, which began somewhere around 312. We, it's pretty easy to, to pick the beginning of the Pergamum church age because uh, of the Nicene Council in 325 A.D. and the, in the Edict of Milan in 312 A.D. And these are two very instrumental events that happened in the beginning of the 4th century that had a very significant impact on the continuation of the church really right up until the present age. Because what you see birthed right here in the Pergamum Church Age is a, is a merger of a political and a religious spirit. And we see that thing maturing today. We see it in its maturity, but it has birthplace right here under the leadership of Constantine. Just in a brief history of Constantine, let me just tell you that he was the Roman ruler and was going into battle and, and had heard about the Christians, you know, at the time of Constantine's emergence as a leader, as a primary predominant leader of Rome. The church was under excruciating persecution, murder and mayhem. 
There have been various edicts that have been initiated beginning with Diocletian all the way back in the first century right up until uh, the beginning of the fourth century where these various edicts were issued by Roman leaders that made it a, a matter of political policy to not only persecute Christians, but to kill them and steal their property and basically make life miserable for them in every possible way. So along comes Constantine, who had this, what supposedly may have had a, an encounter of some nature. We don't know. The jury's still out there, at least from our point of view, from looking at it at a historical perspective. But whatever may have happened with him, whether he did it purely for political reasons, he recognized Christianity. The, the story goes that he was going into battle and was told if God would help him win this battle, then he would recognize Christianity. And, and he won the battle, and he did that. And, uh, you know, we can read some documentation of history that seems to indicate maybe Constantine had a real conversion experience. I have to be honest, the majority of the historical things, at least I've read, contradicted that a little bit. You know, maybe, maybe just said he did it purely out of a political motive. Um, but only God's a judge of that. You know, only God. In one of the cases I, I read where they believed that there was evidence that he had repented at the end of his life and accepted the Lord. Praise the Lord. I hope so. I hope Constantine is in heaven. I, I don't want anybody to go to hell. But his role is significant. What he first did was the issue, the Edict of Milan, which contradicted all of the prior edicts where it no longer was a matter of Roman policy to persecute Christians. In fact, he protected Christians. And for the, if you were living in, that, in 312 AD and you were a Christian, that was huge. That was monumental. And, as, and though that was good in itself, it set the stage for something very sinister. It set the stage for a political spirit, which was the Roman leadership. Ro Pagan Rome at that point was still in control. Most of Rome was purely pagan. They were involved in idolatry and pagan worship. We, we covered that you know, extensively in the last webinar. Oh, we talked about the, the temples that existed in Pergamum. Pergamum as a city was something of the regional hub of the Roman Empire. They ruled all of Asia Minor from Pergamum. And so you had just this cultural center of paganism and idolatry and all the things we talked about in the last webinar. Uh, and so it was very, it was a great influence at that time. It was a significant influence, I should say, uh, for the empire at that time. But, but here uh, Constantine begins to acknowledge Christianity and eventually makes it a matter of public policy that if you serve in his government, you had to be a Christian which, you know, has its flaws. <laughs> That's wonderful that people want to be a Christian, but there has to be a conversion experience. You can't say, I'm going to run for governor, and oh, by the way, I'm a Christian, because that's what Constantine, Constantine says I have to be in order to be a governor. Well, that's not conversion. That's not a heart conversion. But what was even more important was you saw a marriage of this political leadership and a, and a religious spirit. And there you have the birthing of counterfeit Christianity. That's exactly what it is. I'm going to call it what it is. The birthing of a religious system that was called Christianity that had at its roots some very pagan foundations and denied some of the very principles of Christian faith that we all hold dear. Just the fundamentals of faith with the acknowledgement of the blood of Jesus Christ and so on. I'm going to cover a little bit of that as we go along. So let me just, uh, let me comment first here. I want to pick up with something that I left off in the last, last webinar. God's design for His people to live in Babylon for a season. You know, I mentioned just now that this was the birthing of mystery Babylon. And it was a mystery in the days of Jeremiah when the Lord told Jeremiah to prophesy that it was His will, the Lord's will that Israel was to go into captivity and serve Nebuchadnezzar, God's will. And so Israel, the covenant people of God, um, existed in Babylon, but they were not Babylon. Babylon was a carrier of the life of God inside of it, and that's exactly what you see here. There was a season of time when God allowed mystery Babylon to, to carry forward what was known for the most part as Christianity, though it had major problems being a representation of the true Christian faith. But within that, 
within that system, there was a remnant of God's people that were truly in covenant relationship with Him, that were truly apostolic, that were truly prophetic. The Lord has told me there has never been a season of church history when there was not a representation of the true prophetic apostolic gospel represented through all seven church ages. <clears throat> it says that, you know, the seven lampstands, Jesus stood among the seven lampstands and each of the seven churches had a representation of the seven spirits of God in a body of people. Now, although there was this brief reprisal <laughs> where Christians were no longer persecuted and killed, what actually was birthed right here in Mystery Babylon, what was, what was birthed in this religious system, ended up causing more persecution, more mayhem, more murder than pagan Rome ever thought about. I spent hours over the last couple of months going through historical documents, finding the documentations of the numbers of people that have been butchered and slain under the influence of this system, of, under this religious system, under this mystery Babylon that God said He's going to judge because all the blood of the martyrs is in her, full of pagan idolatry and such as that. And, and I, I went through, and I'll, maybe at the end of this, this, these sessions I'm doing on the next couple of webinars, I'll have it organized enough where I can put it up for you to have, to look at and read directly from history the millions and millions and millions of people that it was documented that were butchered and slain and murdered in the name of Christianity. Now that was not being Christian, don't misunderstand that, but it was in the name of Christianity. I have a scripture in here somewhere where, where Jesus said, you know what, you can be something in name, but if you're not, if you're not that in person, it, may, it has no consequence. So let me, let me kind of get back to my notes and I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment. So inside of Babylon, inside of Babylon was Israel. Inside of mystery Babylon is the true church, the true church, true born-again believers of God. And, the, and that system was the carrier of the life of God up until the present age, when now there is a call to come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people. Now listen, <clears throat> I, I want to say something, but I want to say it in a way that it's understood. I believe in unity. I do. I want unity, but it's going to be unity around the revealed truth of God. There will be unity in the revelation of Jesus Christ. There can be no unity with Mystery Babylon. We are living in the hour that the Lord is saying, come out of her, my people. Come out of that system. We're living in an hour of greater revelation than we've ever had in modern church history, certainly. And I believe we're going to begin to equal and even exceed the revelation that was given to the early church because it has to. It has to. This is the harvest. The harvest is greater than the sowing. That was the first fruits harvest in the early church, the Pentecostal church. This is the full harvest. And so there, we're, we're a body of people. We have more revelation. Every revival shed more light on the revelation of God. Every revival removed part of the shuck, if you will, because inside of the shuck is what the wheat, the sons of God. And so every revival peeled back layers of traditions and, and precepts of men and even doctrines of demons until what is left is the true revelation of Jesus Christ inside of a body of people. And that's where we are today. That's why the systems of religion that we see, even some that are called Christians, are struggling because the life, the life is, is <laughs> you organize something and make it, a, make it a democracy and the life of God goes from it. You know, the very thing we talked about a moment ago, we talked about the Edith of Milan and we talk, we're going to talk about, or I'm going to reference at least, the Nicene Council in 325 AD where Constantine calls for 300 leaders of the church. Various leaders from d different segments. If, if you do a reading of some of the people that were represented, some may have been Christians and some maybe are not because some of the heresies they tried to introduce at the, at the Nicene Council were heinous, were very wrong. But here is the, the, the essence of it was to come away with a more centralized belief system which looks good on the surface, but they all presented their arguments. One of the primary ones was the deity of Christ. What was, was Jesus Christ God? And of course, we say absolutely He was God. Absolutely. He and the Father were one, and I won't go into all that because if I start on that, it'll be 15 minutes <laughs> affirming that Jesus Christ was the exact representation of His Father. 
He was God, Emmanuel, God with us. He was the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. Isaiah 9 is prophesying the Messiah, and those descriptions right there are of deity. Jesus Christ is God, period. Now, we believe that emphatically, and I will not waver from that one ounce because that's what the Word of God says. But that was one of the main issues. And at the end of the, of the Nicene Council, they presented their arguments, and they voted. Listen, friends. <laughs> God's kingdom is not a democracy. It's a theocracy. He tells you what's truth and he expects you to believe it, period. So whether they voted one way or another really had no real bearing on the truth because the truth is truth no matter what that council said. Now, they got it right on the deity of God, on the deity of Christ, but, you know, they came out of it with this Nicene Creed, which I know a lot of people recite it and all that, but if it's not in the Word, we don't need creeds. <laughs> we just need the revelation of the Word because you can get into some dangerous territory there because it has to be truth. It has to be undiluted revelation. So anyway, I'll move on from that very quickly. Just give you a few historical quotes from some of the people that studied throughout history. Uh, Constantine. Concerning Constantine's aim, this is on page 3 of the notes if you have them there. Church historian F.J. Flokes Jackson declares, quote, In dealing with the church... His, Constantine's, object was gradually to transfer from heathenism to Christianity all that hitherto made it attractive to the eyes of the people. That description right there is the very description of the spirit of Antichrist. What he said was that Constantine began to transfer from heathenism the things that made the heathenism appealing but overlaid it with terminology and principles of Christianity. And God said, I will curse that. We're going to get into that in just a moment more. But that was what happened with Constantine. That was not God. That was not right. Uh, I have some notes there on Edith of Milan where you can read it for yourself, some of the principles that were laid out there. But already I'm 20 minutes into tonight, so I'm going to leave that for you to read for yourself. But here's the scripture that I was talking about where it says you can call yourself one thing, but if you don't have the foundation of Christ in you, you're not what you say you are. Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 49. Well, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Listen, this is very important because some, someone can call themselves Christian. And this is where it gets tricky. I realize that. Someone can call themselves Christian. We had a, a leader that called himself a Christian, but everything he did was anti-Christian. <laughs> the Bible says, and we don't judge people, but the Bible clearly says we judge fruit. Fruit. You can, a good tree can only produce good fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. That's what the, that's what the Scripture says. And if something calls itself something, but everything that it does is contrary to the very nature and spirit of Christ, then there's something wrong with the label. They aren't what they say they are. And that's just the reality of it. It says, so not, not all that call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say, for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug a deep foundation on the rock. And when the flood occurred, the torrents burst against the house, and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who has heard but not acted accordingly. They've heard the principles of Christianity. They've heard the, the language of Christianity but have not responded on the heart, on the, at the heart level. It, uh, is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation. And the torrent burst against it and immediately it collapsed and the ruin of that house was great. That's what we see there. That's what we see happening in much of what was called Christianity. You cannot be Christian and murder 57 million people, period. Let's just, let's just be honest about that. Can we do that? You cannot say we're a Christian institution and be responsible for the death of 57 million people. Selah. Let's just... The hour's late. We've got to, we've got to be honest about these things. Nobody won't, you know, no. Now, we're talking about a system. God loves people. He loves the people. 
He loves people that have been captured by the system, but he hates the system that has led them astray. And we're going to talk about that here again in just a moment when I get into the spirit of Balaam. And so it's the system that's cursed, and God is saying, I love the people. Come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people, the Lord says. So we're, we're, we're not criticizing people. We're criticizing a spirit that is counterproductive to the purposes of God. We're criticizing a spirit that captures people in idolatry, calling it Christianity. And you know, I can just I can begin to name so many, but I think one of my one of my <laughs> one of my big ones is Easter. Easter is as pagan as it comes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if churches celebrate Easter, you know. Um, but Easter is from the from the goddess Eshtar, the goddess of fertility. It is a it is a Roman Greek Roman. Uh, heathen form of worship. Now, now, let me be very quick to say this. Do I believe in celebrating the resurrection? Absolutely. Every day is a good day to celebrate the resurrection. I take communion every day, almost every day. Almost every day I take communion and that's celebrating the resurrection, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, not just remembering the body that went into the grave, but the body that came out of the grave with glory and honor and power. So yes, I, I believe and if we want to pick a time of year in the springtime uh, to celebrate the resurrection, which I believe we should, because that's exactly when it was, during the Feast of Passover is a wonderful time to do it. <laughs> Let's just don't call it Easter. Let's don't have a bunch of uh, bunny rabbits and Easter eggs running around. That has nothing to do with Christianity. The hour is late, and we need to be mature enough to know that's not God, period. And let's don't teach our children that either. So anyway, that's my, my belief. <laughs> <clears throat> Another quote, Winston Walker, former professor of ecumenical and ecclesiastical. I'm, I'm giving these quotes so you can know that I'm not just basing this on my opinion. <laughs> There's some historical evidence. Winston Walker, pr professor at Yale University, pretty, pretty prestigious university, tells us that in 325, begin quote, <clears throat> Constantine was at last the sole ruler of the Roman world. The church was everywhere free from persecution. Praise the Lord for that, but it didn't last very long. <laughs> Let's keep that in mind. Because the very system that gave the freedom from the persecution became the very system that persecuted the true Christians of God. To the tune of millions and millions of people for over a millennia. Over a millennia. So continuing his quote, the church was everywhere free from persecution. Listen carefully. But in winning its freedom from its enemies, it had come largely under the control of the occupant of the Roman imperial throne. A faithful union with the state had begun. The union of political and the religious spirit. <clears throat> the statement of the doctrine they produced was that of all Christianity would follow and obey called the Nicene Creed. This creed was upheld by the church and enforced by the emperor. That's part of the Nicene Creed, for part of the Nicene Council. Uh, another quote, um, <clears throat> As the new religion now supported by the Roman emperors grew in power and influence, it sought to become the truly universal church. In its ambition to add more members, many new inductees, with all their old worldly traditions and humanistic pagan practices and worldly ambitions, were welcomed into its fold. This is what history said. <clears throat> so I want to move on now, but I, was, I, want to, I, want to, I wanted to stress the fact that what was birthed there, what, what many have called a wonderful thing, may not have been so wonderful. It was wonderful that for a brief season the persecution ended, and if you were part of the church at that day, that was a great thing. But what was birthed in Pergamum, what was birthed in the, church, in the Pergamum church age was one of the most sinister, diabolical religious systems the world has ever seen that will be judged in the book of Revelations. The system that was birthed out of that. Because while eventually, initially I should say, it was the Roman, pagan Roman empire that took on the label of Christianity, it eventually became the Christian church that had the political power of Rome. In other words, the two switched. It was more called, a, you know, the Christian church, and it was universal. Every nation on the planet today is influenced by that spirit. 
It's just the truth. It's the fact of the matter. So now let me get to the spirit of Balaam. That was my foundation <laughs> that I wanted to lay. Please understand there's so much more that could be said. I'm just trying to give you seed form revelation enough that you can begin to work on, do your own research, and you find these things out. But here's what I wanted to focus on tonight. Three things, really. I want to focus on the spirit of Balaam. I want to focus on the hidden manna and the white stone, the new name and the white stone. That will be what we'll take for the rest of tonight. The spirit of Balaam. <clears throat> so what you see in the Pergamum church age was that Satan's strategy shifted. His strategy for a couple of hundred years was to just kill the Christians. Just annihilate them, wipe them from the face of the earth, kill them all. That was the intention, and he threw some Jew Jews in there too in many instances. And of course, he's always tried to kill the Jewish people because salvation is of the Jews. We addressed that in the last webinar. So his strategy was just to kill them. We'll just kill. I have the political power. The red horse rider is running, and we have the sword, the, the, the ability, the political power to begin to kill them, so they began to persecute them. But the problem was there was a spiritual dynamic in work. And that was called the justice of God. You sow, you sow one, you're going to reap more. So every time you kill one Christian, ten more popped up because that's the, the principles of sowing and reaping. That's the principles of justice. God said, you take one of mine, I'm going to bring back seven more or ten more or a hundred more or a thousand more. And so the more he killed the Christians, the more the Christians came up. <laughs> and so that strategy wasn't working. So he, did, he remembered, Satan remembered that he one time tried to curse Israel, but the curse never worked. But what did work was compromise. So Satan remembered an Old Testament strategy that worked for him back then, and he employed that same strategy in the New Testament church, and that was the spirit of Balaam. I had an interesting thing happen. I hope they paint a picture uh, because it's resurfaced again with me in recent months where the Lord has begun to talk to me about these two bookends uh, of the enemy strategy. But I had an experience. I want you to listen carefully because I don't want there to be many, any misunderstanding because I'm going to talk about William Branham for just a moment. But way back in the 1990s, I had a pretty profound revelatory encounter. And this was early 90s, early, I think 1993 if I remember right. <clears throat> but but at that point, I had been studying William Branham, and I was conflicted a little bit, not with his message at all. I was conflicted with his death. I was conflicted with his death. It hurt me, it grieved me that at the age of 56, this man, this man of God that loved the Lord with all of his heart. Listen, I believe William Branham was a champion. I believe he was an overcomer. I believe he sits on the overcomer's throne right now. I believe he was one of God's greats. I do, I believe that. Now you might, and you know, I'm not going to do all the disclaimers tonight. I know some people are teaching that William Branham barely got into heaven by the skin of his teeth. I believe that's an error. I do. I'm sorry. I believe that's an error. I, I feel like I've seen some things. I've had some encounters, and I believe the Lord has told me and Rick Joyner and other people the same thing. But William Branham was a great man of God. So I was conflicted that he would go home at the age of 56 and die in a car crash. The way he died just seems, you know, difficult, you know, or a difficult thing to accept. So I went to the Lord. I said, Lord, I, I need to understand why, why, you know, he's, he's right at the pinnacle of his ministry. He just had seven angels come and give him the revelation of the seven seals. And, and, and he was believing that the third pull, as he called it, the power of the spoken word was about to be launched. And, 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 and he dies in a car crash, hit head on by a drunk driver. And so in the midst of me having that discussion with the Lord, I actually had a conversation with William Branham's daughter. I was kind of conflicted and I had been ordering material. This is back, you got to realize in the early 90s, you didn't have the internet. None of the material was on the internet like it is today. So I was in conversation, regular conversation with a lady at, in Jeffersonville that was helping me choose which tapes and all that I got. I would order 15 a month or 20 a month and listen to them, order 15 or 20. So she and I were in a regular conversation and I expressed my concerns about some of the issues, not, about my, my heartache, if you will, uh, about the way he died. And she said, you need to talk to William Branham's daughter. Here's her number. <laughs> and she gave me Rebecca Branham's phone number at home and said, you tell her I told you to call. She said, I'm a personal friend. 
And, and she, this lady knew me well enough by then to know that I was sincere. So I called her up. I called up Rebecca Branham, <laughs> William Branham's daughter. And uh, she was incredibly gracious. She's in heaven now. But she talked with me about the death experience. And, it's, and it, it settled the score. You know, a lot of fanaticism, and I'm going to talk about that, was surrounding his death. And people thought he was going to be raised from the dead. And they, you know, just they didn't bury his body. People, there's this big criticism still today that they say they didn't bury William Branham's body because because they believed he was going to be resurrected even months after he died. Well, his own daughter told me the only reason they didn't bury William Branham immediately after his death was because her mother had been injured so severely in the car accident with a brain injury that she was in no condition to make the decision whether to bury him in Tucson or Jeffersonville, so they waited until she was able to make that decision before they buried him. That came straight from William Branham's daughter, straight from her lips to my ears. So that ought to eradicate that, that rumor that still exists today, still exists today. So let me move on. So I was conflicted, so I called her, and she talked to me about some of the death experience. So here, now, let me jump to my experience. In the midst, that was the foundation of me having this experience. So I'm caught up in some kind of revelatory thing. This was happening to me a lot back in those years, where I was taken. It was so real at the time, I don't know that it's not real. It, that's the kind of thing that would happen, especially back in those years on a pretty frequent basis. And I found myself standing out in a, what looked like a desert area. And there was a group of people standing there waiting for prayer. And I looked up and William Branham walks up. And Brother Branham was standing there and the people were here. And my job in this experience was to escort people over to him, walk them over maybe 10 or 12, 15 feet to where he was standing. And he would minister to them and I would escort them back and bring the next person back. So I did that. So I carried, you know, people back and forth, and, and I, I can't remember now, three, four, five people, I would go up and he would pray, and miracles were happening, and I was so thankful to get to see that, you know, see the miracles and watching minister and, and so on. And finally I walked over, and there was a woman that I began to escort back over that I found out later was, was representing the church, and I didn't even notice it, but when I brought her to Brother Branham, Brother Branham pushed me back. And, and, and kind of startled me, and he reached up and he grabbed two serpents. This woman walked up holding one serpent in this arm and one serpent in this arm. And he pushes me away from the serpents, and he grabs them each by the heads. And so I'm escorting the woman back, and I kind of look back, and Brother Branham is kind of contending with these serpents, you know. And, um, and I walk back over to him, and I said, Did he get you? Did he get you? And I watched the two snakes slither off down into this ravine, both of them together. One was larger than the other, and one of them had bit him. Now, I want to be very quick to say this because I had someone misinterpret my own revelation and wrote it in a book. I do not believe these, this poison got into Brother Branham. I believe it was an influence around him that affected his life and death. That's what I believe. And I was told that these two spirits were criticism and fanaticism criticism and fanaticism. And the Lord told me in this experience, though he was criticized, criticism is not what adversely affected the ministry. What has adversely affected the ministry was fanaticism. Criticism is external. Fanaticism is internal. The ministry of William Branham was criticized harshly. They didn't like the way he preached. He butchered the king's English. They didn't like divine healing. They didn't like the revelation. They didn't like the words of knowledge. What all the reasons were, they criticized, but the more they criticized him, the bigger the meetings were. <laughs> the, 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 the more, you know, the more miracles, the, you know, the more criticism, just like with Rome, the more they tried to kill the Christians, the more it expanded. But what, what was more effective, what, what did effectively adversely affect the ministry of William Branham was fanaticism. Fanaticism. And it's still true today. You still see those two spirits. I believe the Lord showed me the two spirits that I, I believe were released in these earlier years of the church history, but also against this man, that people began to be fanatical, taking teachings way beyond the parameters of scriptures, calling him Elijah. To this very day, people still believe that he thought he was Elijah. 
<clears throat> even though there is a taped message from 1964 where he rebuked the people harshly. You rarely heard William Branham use a harsh tone, but he did that night. And he harshly rebuked the people for calling him Elijah. Some baptized in the name of William Branham. That almost took, he actually said on this tape, he said, when I found out people were baptizing my name, he said, I thought about going out in the woods and blowing my brains out. He said, I'd rather face God as a quitter than as an antichrist. And what was it? Fanaticism. Fanaticism. And the Lord told me that I have to be careful. When I mean by, what I mean by that is, if I'm, if I'm observing a ministry, my tendency would be not to withdraw because of criticism, but if there is a fanatical element around it, I don't like fanaticism, so I would pull away. And so one is external, one is internal. And I think that's what you see here. The enemy's strategy became an internal strategy. The spirit of Balaam. The story of Balaam is this, Numbers chapter 22, 23, and 24. Israel has come out of Egypt, the part of the Red Sea. They're being led by the pillar of fire. I'm just going to have to cover some ground quickly now. But they're being led by the pillar of fire. They've already had conflict with the Amorites, Am Amalekites, I should say. God gave them victory. And now they're passing through this land. And Balak, the, the king of, of Moab, looked upon Israel and he became nervous. He said, you know what? These folks are more numerous than the sand. They're, they've already been victorious and they, you know, I'm nervous about them coming through. They're going to consume our resources. So he calls upon the services of a prophet. The Bible called Balaam a prophet. And he says, I want you to, I want you to curse them. So he sends representatives to Balaam and they, and they say, you know, we want you, the king wants you to come and curse Israel so that, God, so that we can defeat them in battle. You know, that's kind of a wrong strategy to begin with. But, you know, David inquired of the Lord. And if the Lord says, go up, take them, I'll give them into your hands. He went, but if he didn't, they didn't. So there's a big difference between calling a prophet to go curse somebody and calling a prophet to inquire of the Lord. <coughs> and so they, Balaam told the, told the people, listen, um, give me the night. I'll pray and see what happens. And the Lord appeared. That's a pretty amazing prophet. The Lord himself appeared to Balaam and says, listen, don't you go with him. He said, I will not let you curse Israel. You tell them you send them back home. And he did. He sent them home. If the story had ended there, Balaam would be a hero. <laughs> but it didn't end there. Balak sends back another crew, more prestigious than the one before, with more riches and more honor. And, and, and they say, come, you know, the king wants you to come curse Israel. And he says, let me, let me go to the Lord. Well, that was, his, that was his mistake. He already had the answer. Just because they sent more money, just because they sent more prestigious people, didn't mean God changed his mind. It wasn't like he was bargaining with them. <laughs> he already told Balaam what to do. And Balaam goes back to God and God says, okay, it's almost like he says, go ahead, you go. But I'm not going to let you curse them. Every time you open your mouth, you're going to bless them. And that's exactly what happened. So Balaam gets on his donkey and he's going to... To, to Balak because he was going to try to curse Israel and the donkey and the eyes of the donkey are open and an angel is standing in the way. This is the great story of Balaam and, and the, an angel was standing in the way to kill Balaam, <laughs> the prophet. And the donkey turns away and Balaam strikes the donkey and goes down a little vineyard where there's a wall on either side and the angel appears again with a drawn sword and the donkey presses against the wall and hurts Balaam's foot and he hits him again and and they go down another corridor, another, another trail, and there's no way to go to the right or to the left. And the angel appears a third time, and the donkey just falls to the ground. <laughs> and Balaam strikes the donkey, and that's when the Lord gave the donkey the ability to talk. He said, why are you striking me? What, what have I done to you but be faithful to you all these years? And eventually the eyes of Balaam were open, and he saw the angel of the Lord, and he still went anyway. <laughs> I think that's the point I would have gone home. I would have gone home. I hope I would have done that. And so we know the story. Balaam goes and he tries to curse Israel and the most beautiful blessing comes out of his mouth. And Balak's upset, tries to curse him again, blesses them again. Every time he opened his mouth to curse Israel, he blessed them. But here, here, here is what happened. Even after all of that, Israel, after... Balaam tried to curse Israel with an external 
conflict. What he couldn't do externally, he did internally because he counseled Israel to cohabitate. Maybe something along the lines of, listen, we're cousins. <laughs> you're descendant from Lot. You're descendant from, you know, from, uh, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we're, we're cousins. We, we don't have to be at odds with one another. We, we've got some pagan principles. Yes, that's true. But, you know, we, we have an altar. We, do, we burn sacrifices. We do what you do. And let's just kind of co-mingle and cohabitate together. And let's just all get along. Does that sound like something today? And this is what you find in verse 20, chapter 25 of Numbers. While Israel, now after Balaam couldn't curse them, and they lived under this blanket of protection from God. Nobody was going to touch Israel because they were protected from external conflict. But this is what happens. While Israel remained at Shittim, Shedim, sorry, Shedim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. They began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. For they had invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal Peor, and the Lord was angry against Israel. It says here that they sacrificed things to idols and ate what they had sacrificed. Listen to what it says in Revelation chapter 2. But I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold to the teachings of Balaam, and they keep teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So what Satan couldn't do externally, he couldn't curse them, he got them to compromise. Balak couldn't destroy the armies of Israel. But God destroyed 24,000 of them before the plague. The, the men of Israel began to lay with the daughters of Moab, but more, worse than that, they began to eat the things that had been sacrificed to idols. They allowed heathenism into the camp. They allowed idolatry. Maybe it was just subtle. Maybe it was just little things initially. Oh, we'll call this, you know, the, the, the covenant relationship with God, but we'll inject some of these heathenistic practices. We don't know how it happened, but it was surely subtle. And, a, and, a, and what, what the enemy couldn't do, God did. God got mad at them. And that blessing was removed, and they began to die to the tune of 24,000 of them. And the antidote, the antidote to compromise was the jealousy of God. A Moabite woman or a Midianite woman and an Israelite man went into a tent to lay with one another. And Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest, drew a spear and went into the tent and drove the spear through the man and the woman and killed both of them in the act. And God says, because, listen to this. I'll just read it to you straight from the scripture. And he killed them both because of his jealousy. Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them so that I did not destroy the sons of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore, behold, I will make him a covenant of peace and that it shall be for him and his descendants after him a covenant of a perpetual peace. <clears throat> the jealousy of God. Now God, the scriptures draw the analogy right here between what happened with Balaam. You might say, well, where does it tell us that Balaam counseled Israel. Chapter 31 and verse 16 says this, And Moses said to them, Have you spared all the women? Behold, these caused the sons of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. It says here that the teachings of Balaam introduced something into the covenant people of God. And what the enemy couldn't do externally he accomplished internally. He might even call that fanaticism, calling it compromise. It is compromise. It is absolutely compromise. Now my point is this. <clears throat> if that's the way the Lord felt about it in the days of Israel, 
if that's the way he felt about it back in the days that this was written in the first century, I don't think he's changed his opinion about it today. He is as jealous for his word today as he was then. Why are we so flippant about it? Why, why you know, I, one of the things, I think one of the, if, if one of the gifts maybe, I don't know if that's the right word, that the Lord has given me is when I came to, to this message that I'm preaching today 20-something years ago, 27 years ago, 28 years ago, I had no opinions. I was not churched. I, that was a gift. I didn't, you know, I had been to, I had done some teachings in college and I, had, I was a believer, but I was very nominal, but I didn't have any real strong convictions, you know. So I, I, didn't, I didn't have a religious structure built into me that I had to discard or dismantle before I could move into the revelation of the truth. I just told the Lord, you tell me what's true and I'll believe it. And I meant that. I meant that. I actually said, if you'll tell me what's true, I'll believe it and I'll fight for it. <laughs> and he challenged me on that. Even in the early days when I was the new kid on the block, I was challenged to stand up for truth in, in some meetings. And it was difficult because these were well-known leaders and such. But, but I'm not trying to make myself look great. I'm just simply saying I approached the Word with this, you just show me what's true and I'll believe it. Listen, when I believed the message of William Branham, I didn't know that there was anybody else that believed it was true. I didn't know one person. When I, when I first started sharing some of the revel, revelations that I had learned by studying that man's ministry, people told me, they told me some serious stuff. <laughs> you know, and, and so, you know, so my, and today, there's one minister in particular I, I mocked me in a meeting one time because of what I taught about Brother Bannum, and I watched him myself not long ago teaching the very thing. <laughs> And I forgave him. It was, it was all forgiven. That was not the issue. I'm just simply saying there is a realm of understanding today that didn't exist 20 years ago. And people are embracing things that we didn't embrace 20 years ago. And so my deal is I want to be careful. That's, that's my admonition. That's what I'm trying to say to you tonight. I want to be careful that I don't believe idolatry mingled in with truth. That's why we've got to be jealous about Christmas and Easter and, and, and how we baptize and just things that are being revealed as, the, as being the true Word of God. How we look at the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is He? It's important. What we believe matters. And God, if what, if what the enemy can't conquer externally, he'll try to come in and try to destroy internally. So we have to be true to the Word of God because that's what's called the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. What had been the deeds in a previous age became a doctrine. It was the deeds of the Nicolaitan in the Ephesian age. It became the doctrine. In other words, now you have a political system that has merged itself with a religious spirit and now they've made that a foundation of the faith to conquer the laity. And therein you have the, this, this priesthood um, you know, I'm trying to say it without, without being too, too critical, but this form of priesthood that basically tells the people that sit in the pews, we'll tell you what to believe. In fact, it used to be preached for, for hundreds of years. The gospel was preached in a language that people couldn't even understand by this false religious system. They wouldn't even allow the people in the pews to have a copy of the Bible. Now, how far from God can you be from that? One of the things it says right here, the Lord reveals Himself as the one with the sharp two-edged sword. Chapter 12, verse 12, I should say, the one who has a sharp two-edged sword says this. In other words, the Lord reveals Himself as what? The Word. The Word. He reveals Himself to the Pergamum church age as the Word because this is the age that the Word became under, came under attack. And we saw the seeds of that even in Ephesus where there's false brethren and false apostles where they were already wanting to to do that, but, but the church itself was able to keep that at bay for the most part. But now, the very institution of Christianity that would be known, that was about to be known worldwide, has at its very foundation false teachings and idolatry built into the very foundation of it. And it became known as the Christian church of the day for a thousand, over a thousand years, well over a thousand years, until the, until the, until the Reformation, until the Protestant Reformation. I would challenge some of you to go back and read some of the writings of the reformers. And they don't mince words about this spirit and this institution. 
Here again, we're, we're against the spirit, not the people that are in it. Amen? So let me move on. It's already, gosh, it's already 7.50, and so I, I need to move on very quickly. I have a bunch of notes here that I never got past point one. <laughs> Talking about Balaam, maybe you can read it, because Balaam is identified as a spirit we have to deal with. In the book of Jude, the spirit of Cain, Korah, and Balaam are all three identified as spirits that we have to deal with in the New Testament church. You might say, why did God get so upset when the Moabitess people, women, laid with the Israelite men? <clears throat> well, because, number one, it was fornication. Number two, it was idolatry, introducing idolatry. But it created, listen carefully, an, an environment that eventually produced Jezebel. Because that is exactly what Ahab did. Ahab, being a, in the co it should have been in a covenant relationship with God, married the daughter of a pagan priest. The very thing that was 24,000 people were killed for in Numbers 25, the very king of Israel did, setting, setting her up over all of Israel, which is exactly what the Bible tells us happened right here. What was initiated right here in Pergamum became Jezebel religion in the future church age. Thyatira talks about now what was, just, what was just introduced, what was seemingly innocent, became the woman Jezebel residing over the entirety of the known church of the day. Even though we know now they were entitled only. Maybe there were some believers in there. We don't know. God only knows. But in the heart of that, there was a body of people hiding out in catacombs and caves, running for their life that were the true believers of God. But it set the stage for, for Jezebel. That's that, uh, that idolatrous, murdering woman <laughs> that we see introduced in the Old Testament. Cain, Korah, and Balaam are three spirits that are going to be dealt with. And so on. I, I talk some more here about the merchandising of the anointing, how the, that was basically what introduced, what, you know, apparently maybe we, we can kind of presume that he went ahead and got his money because what he couldn't do by cursing them, he gave counsel and said, well, listen, I can't curse them, but here's how, here's how you can get them. Go tell your women to go lay with them and introduce idolatry to them. And the very thing that's protecting them, the walls will come down, the hedge will come down, and then what you couldn't do, God will do himself. He'll, they'll come out of covenant relationship with God, and the enemy can come in to kill them. And that's what happened. So you can read some of the notes there. Because let me, let me move on you know, here pretty quickly. And I want to, uh, gosh, I had a lot of notes. I had a lot of good notes there. The reward. <clears throat> the reward. You know, I could wait and do this whole one in the next webinar. And in fact, I'm kind of leaning that way because I, it's already almost eight o'clock and, and I, have, I, have, I really want to cover, <laughs> I want to cover this with uh, more detail and, and go into it. So let me just think here for just a minute. Maybe what I'll do is just hit the high points and maybe we'll do one more webinar on the Pergamon Church and, um, and, and we'll, we'll go from there. So let me just hit the high points. To him that overcomes, verse 17, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone which no one knows except him that receives it. From the beginning of my walk, all the way back in the early 90s, that scripture has stood out to me. I don't know, I, even back then, I never knew why. I mean, I love all the blessings given to all seven churches to eat of the tree of, uh, the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. But there's always been something from day one, from day one with me, 1990, I've been after truth. You know, it's just something God put in me. And I'm not saying I have all truth. Don't misunderstand. I'm just after truth. I want the truth. I, if, I, if I'm believing something that's not right, I want to be tweaked because I have no agenda. I don't have any allegiance to a religious order or an institution or uh, you know, a quote-unquote denomination, or I, you know, I want the truth. And I'm trusting God by the spirit of truth. He will guide us into all truth. And so this idea of eating, eating hidden manna has always been appealing to me. It's always been something that I have desired to do because I know that it has to do with revelation. And I've always been after revelation. It has to do with an encounter. I like what it says in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 19 that that you may know through personal experience the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience. 
that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. And if we're going to be filled up to the fullness of God, we're going to have to go behind the veil. There is revelation. There's, there's a certain amount of revelation in the outer court. There's an even greater amount of revelation in the holy place where you see the lampstand shedding light on the bread of His presence. And that's what sanctifies us. That's, that's, the, that's the Pentecostal experience. That's where we begin to learn about faith and about all the things that are, that are important to us in our, in our faith and our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. But then the, on the other side of the veil, there's hidden manna, something that no one can access unless they themselves go to the other side of the veil. In other words, it says here, to him that overcomes will I give the hidden manna. There is hidden revelation that belongs to the overcomer that is not given to those that don't overcome. But people might criticize that, but that's what the scripture teaches. Hidden manna. It says it right here in Hebrews chapter 9. Behind the second veil there was a tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was also a golden jar holding the manna, and Aaron's rod which had budded, and the tablets of the covenant. So behind the veil, to him that overcomes, just like with the tree of life, to him that overcomes will I grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. My belief is, that none of these things, none of these benefits to the overcomers will be fully embraced and enjoyed until the Lord returns and sets up His kingdom on the earth. But we can taste them on this side of that. We can taste the good word of God and the powers of the age to come on this side of His return. It's important to understand. So when we overcome, what do we have to overcome? We have to overcome the teachings of Balaam. You've had to overcome that. You've had to overcome lukewarm Christianity. If you want to know what the mystery Babylon looks like, it looks like if you want to see it today, it's lukewarm Christianity. A form of godliness that denies the power thereof. A form of quote-unquote Christianity that doesn't, much of which, a huge percentage of the body of Christ that don't even believe in divine healing, don't believe in prophetic, don't believe in visions, don't believe in revelations, don't even believe in angels, don't believe in much of the very foundations of the things given to us in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2 and, and follows and so on and the epistles of Paul. And so, you know, we have to overcome that. We have to overcome the propensity to be accepted because most of us, when we embrace the fullness of the gospel, we got, probably got ridiculed. I, I certainly did. Uh, I, you know, I won't go into all that for the sake of time, but I lost friends, I lost associations, I even lost business because I became a holy roller. <laughs> And so on it goes. So this is not outer court. It's not holy place. It is holy of holies revelation to him that's victorious. To the ones that are victorious in this struggle to overcome the teachings of Balaam, to overcome idolatry. You might say, well, I wouldn't embrace idolatry. We don't need, people don't even realize how much idolatry has been filtered into the New Testament, to the modern day church. So much of it has. And we, we've addressed some of that and we'll address more as we go. So it's given in the wilderness. You know, you know, the man, Jesus himself said he was the manna. John chapter 6 says, I am the bread of, uh, bread of life. He, John 6, the Lord multiplies the bread and the fish. And then he sits down and he says, I am the bread. I am the manna. So when, one of the reasons I know now that I so embrace this blessing given to those of Pergamum to go behind the veil and eat the hidden manna is because you are partaking of Christ. You are, you are consuming a part of Him. It, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation 5, you see the sealed book held in the hand of the Father, taken from the Father's hand by the Lord who overcame. And He goes over and He breaks the seals and we see Him now in Revelation chapter 10 coming to the earth having the now open book in His hand. And he, and he tells John to take the book. The, the strong angel says, take the book and eat it. It'll be in your mouth as sweet as honey, but in your stomach it'll be made bitter. So John said, I took the little book and I ate it, and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said, you must prophesy again concerning many nations, tongues, tribes, and kingdoms. That is the hidden manna. That is the reserved truth 
That is the revelation of Jesus Christ. You can read the scripture for yourself in John. I won't read it for the sake of time. That is the hidden revelation that will perfect the bride of Christ. That is why it is so vitally important. Listen, if you're going to be a part of the bride of Christ, you must overcome. To the church right, but to him that overcomes will I grant to eat of the hidden manna. And I'll give him a new name. When you overcome, you get a new name. You get a new identity. And we're gonna, maybe I'll talk, I'll talk about that here in just a minute. But I want to emphasize here the hidden manna. Much, many of us have had an appeal, have, have been drawn to Jeremiah 33.3. 3. Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you. This is the Amplified Version. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you and even show you great and mighty things. Things which have been confined and hidden, which you do not know and understand and cannot distinguish. The word there, great and mighty things, means fenced in or otherwise inaccessible by height or fortification. In the Hebrew, the analogy would be like fruit that is on a tree, but it's so high that it's inaccessible. The fruit is there, but you can't quite reach it. Something has to help you get there to access the fruit. Call upon me and I will answer you and tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. Great and mighty things which have been confined and hidden, fenced in, and otherwise, before now, inaccessible. It is the new thing. It is Isaiah chapter 48, verses 6 and 7. Where he, where he says, I, you know, I have a new thing and it's, it's called into being by the spirit of prophecy. It is a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ that takes us to a place of union and intimacy. Listen, we will not be fully joined with Christ in a union experience unless we have eaten of the hidden manna. Unless we have eaten of the pure, undiluted revelation of Jesus Christ. And the bride of Christ will insist on it. The bride of the people that are born to be a part of the bride that have that are foreknown. I say I want to say foreknown. God saw the end from the beginning. He saw every person's desire before they were ever born. And those of you that are foreknown before the foundation of the world and had a seed of destiny put in you, you will be compelled to overcome. You will be driven to overcome because you are on a quest to eat of this hidden manna. You are on an absolute journey and you will not be denied until you have eaten of the hidden money. You have partaken of Christ in a way that goes beyond just salvation, even beyond the baptism of the Holy Spirit, into a place of intimacy and union that is so sacred and so personal you wouldn't even dare talk about much of what has gone on in that place. But when you do, you are, you are transformed, you are changed. You are never the same person when you have an experience behind the veil and eat of the hidden manna. He gives you a revelation of his heart that is so profound that you then become a carrier of his heart. <clears throat> I want that very much. The bride of Christ will be the carrier of the heart of God. She will steward the heart of God on planet earth. And, that, and, you, and you're going to have to go behind the veil. The strategies and the model for what's coming cannot be found on planet Earth. I said this in a blog. It can only be found in the unseen realm, behind the veil. That's what the hidden man is. Colossians chapter 2, That their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of what? Understanding resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery. Some of the older translations just say resulting in a knowledge of God's mystery, but the word there is actually a true knowledge, implying there can be a false knowledge, implying that there can be idolatry woven into Christianity that is a for false form of knowledge, but when you begin to access this hidden manna, when you begin to access the heart of God, when you begin to partake of Christ, then you have the true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, what? In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's the hidden manna. Where are they? In Christ, behind the veil, inside of his heart. Things that were held and reserved that even Daniel saw way back in Babylon, Babylonian captivity, but was unable to write because they were sealed in a book, held until the right generation was on planet earth, which is us. And when we overcome today, when we overcome today and begin to share in the blessing that overcome, we can taste that revelation. We can taste 
of the hidden manna. The fullness of it will come when Jesus Christ rends the heavens, sets his foot on the Mount of Olives, and he sets up his kingdom on planet earth, and we begin to rule and reign on planet earth. The bride of Christ will do that. The bride will rule and reign with Christ on planet earth. That will absolutely happen. <clears throat> well, amen. I want to do this justice, so I'm going to stop right there with the hidden manna. We'll pick up next webinar uh, because I, it will take me 20 minutes to cover the white stone and the new name. <laughs> and I, I, I want to do it, I want to do it Joe. We haven't, we're in no hurry with these things. You know, we're going to do them a month as we go. Um, I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope this has helped you. I hope we can begin to understand and we begin to look at church history. And why is it important to be able to analyze church history? Because we can identify these two spirits as they operate. And believe me, I don't want any of that spirit in me. See, I'm not pointing a finger saying they have a false spirit or they have you know, idolatry woven into their belief system. I don't want any woven in me. And believe me, all of us, all of us, especially in Western Christianity, I would assume most all of us, have had the Lord purging that stuff out of us. Because what little Christianity I knew was in a Baptist church and, I, and some of that leaven got in me. And I had, you know, the Lord. But the good news for me was the Lord told me, you know, I, Lord, he did, I told the Lord, He put it in me to believe the truth no matter what the truth was. I had never, I had no concept, I had no grid in my brain to think that God would visit a human being on planet Earth when He, when he told me that. The idea in 1989 for me... <laughs> that Almighty God, the creator of the universe, would actually allow a human being to stand in His presence or that He would come Himself and stand in that person's room. or, or man, That was a, as far in a concept to me as one humanly possible. But the Lord showed me it's true and now it's a part of my very foundation, my core belief system. And the visions and experiences and angelic, and I've encountered, I've seen the Lord Jesus. <laughs> You know, and, 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 and every time I have any kind of encounter like that, it peels away layer after layer and creates greater hunger. That's what this will do. And we, the bride of Christ, listen, why, why is this important for the voice of the bride? Because our responsibility in the last days will to bring, to bring millions out of that spirit. Millions of our brethren are captured by that spirit right there that was birthed in Pergamum that's matured today. And the bride of Christ will have the love of God, the manifested love of God. She will demonstrate perfect love. It will not be like any, any meetings we saw in, in the past. It won't just be calling a healing line, although there'll be healing. Don't misunderstand that. It's going to be manifested love that releases healing. It's going to be manifested love that restores marriage. It's going to be manifested loves that prophesies the truth. It's going to be manifested love that delivers the oppressed. It's going to be the heart of God. And a body of people will begin to see our society, our culture through the eyes of God and begin to prophesy it. And even, even for Christ, the Christian church, it's going to be counter to what they believe right now. And the bride of Christ will be a voice. That's what the, that's what the world is waiting for, the voice of the bride the voice of the bride to begin to echo the heart of God on planet earth to begin to shatter these belief systems because we have millions, just in America alone, millions and millions of our brethren are captured and held captive by this counterfeit form of Christianity. They have paganism and heathenism and idolatry woven in to the very foundation and fabric of their belief system and they have confessed Christ. They've accepted the Lord for the remission of their sins but, they, but their garments are stained with heathenism and traditions and the, the spirit of this world. And so the reason you're drawn to the voice of the bride webinar and others like it is because you're called to be a voice. To echo, you know, and everything God's going to do today will be in love. Listen, if we're going to go out there and point our finger and say and be critical of them, you've already missed the whole point. Because what's coming will not be criticism. It'll be the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. That is the absolute truth. If we think we're going to go out and just you know, hit people head on and, 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 be, and tell them how horrible they are, listen, that's not God. That's not, that's not the mandate of the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is to manifest love. You know what will come with manifested love? Conviction. Conviction. That's what I have seen it. I've, 
I, I wish sometimes I could express, I wish I was a great orator so I could express in words some of what I've seen over the last, especially the last few months. It just that when manifested love comes, I've seen it in the meetings, I've seen it in these encounters where, where it, it does all the things that we, we want to do, but it's, if I can put it this way, it, it will be easy. <laughs> it's, it's not like we're gonna have to muster an atmosphere for the miraculous. When, the, when manifested love comes, the miraculous will be a byproduct. When manifested loves come, you don't have to dangle people over hell with a rotten stick. They're going to run to the altar. I've seen it in these encounters. I've seen it. People will run. They will beg you to tell them how they can have that love in their life. But it's going to take somebody going behind the veil to bring the heart of God back to planet Earth in a way that we've never seen it in our generation. That's the mandate. That's the, that's the directive that's being given to the bride of Christ. And somebody's got to pay a price. Somebody's going to have to go through some hell to get to heaven. <laughs> in other words, we'll go through the wilderness and whatever we have to go through. But, but, but on the other side of that is access to the heart of God to eat things that are held in the holy of holies in the very presence of God and the Shekinah glory of God. Can you imagine eating something, eating the hidden manna? I, I like the story, and I'll close with this, you know. <clears throat> but there was a man by the name of Roland Buck that I believe was a true man of God. I did a lot of research back in the early 90s and actually wrote a book in, the, in 2002, I think it was, uh, Books of Destiny, where I talked about Roland Buck and how he fulfilled a prophecy of William Branham, too much to go into now. But, but I, I went to his church and interview, interviewed his widow and his daughter and his son and elders of the church. and actually went there twice and I did my due diligence before I came out publicly and acknowledged that I believe this man had 27 visitations from Gabriel. Roland Buck is the man that was on January 21st, 1977, 40 years ago, caught up to heaven, to the throne room of heaven, was given 120 future events that all happened in sequence exactly as he was told. And then following that trip to heaven, he began to have visitations from Gabriel where Gabriel showed up in his bedroom the first night, set him up against the headboard and began to talk to him, I think he said, for an hour and a half, if I have that right. And so that was the initiation of 27 separate visitations from the angel Gabriel and other angels came too, but 27 specific and unique visitations. And the Lord told me that ministry was a transitionary. Gabriel comes to transition us out of one age into another. And the transition was out of the Laodicean age into the kingdom, which we have been in. It's, a, it's not a... It's not a switch, it's a dial. You move slowly from one season into the next. We're moving closer and closer and into the kingdom, the kingdom revelation, where the Laodicean spirit is, has no grace on it anymore. People cannot stay in the Laodicean atmosphere that are true children of God. They just can't do it. Anyway, <laughs> here's the story I wanted to tell. In one of the visitations, I don't know which one, how far into it, maybe seven or eight visitations of Gabriel, the angel Gabriel comes to Roland Buck and he brings him bread from heaven. You can believe that if you want. I believe it. He brings him a, a bread cake that was five inches wide and five inches long, a little over a half inch in thickness, and he told him to eat it. And he ate it, and he said it tasted like honey, which is exactly what the manna was. The Bible says that when the Israel went out to gather the manna each day, it looked like coriander. I believe is how you said it, coriander seed and it tasted like honey. And he ate this bread cake and it tasted like honey and he gave him a goblet of water and he drank the water and he erupted into uncontrollable praise and worship. He said the water just went right through his veins and this fizzing sensation and he lifted his hands and praised and worshiped and, and, and so on. And something wonderful happened. He woke up the next day and five pounds were gone. He ate the bread cake one day, the next day five pounds of fat were gone, the next day five more pounds of fat were gone, the next day five more, and the next day five more. 20 pounds of fat eradicated from his body in, tw in four days, in four days. And then an another pound or two after that for the next several days until he was free of fat and he went on the strength. He said that he had strength and energy and he talked about the fact that he could run and not grow weary and you know, he didn't he, he exercise and he had all this energy and so on and so on. That's a nice byproduct. I'd like to eat some of that. I know what now is going to be in the prayer list of everybody that's listening to me tonight <laughs> to eat of the hidden manna. We've got some pounds we need to get rid of. 
But you know, the bread of angels, man did eat the bread of angels is what it says, I believe in Psalm 78. Man ate the bread of angels. They ate something from the unseen realm. What was unseen became manifested in the seen realm. Amen. So Lord, I pray your blessings upon those that have watched. I pray this has been a blessing to you and will help you. I've got a couple of questions here that I will, I will try to answer very quickly. I, I don't like to keep people too long. <clears throat> I know people have, uh, but I know this is archived as well. Um, here's a good question from someone named Leslie. Um, this was one of those where I made a statement, and she, in a very, very kind and loving way, just wanted me to clarify it. And I, I made the statement that we don't command angels. And she made a good point, you know, of how we do the work that Jesus did and so on, and all that. So let me comment about that. Here, you know, I, you know, I don't... <clears throat> I believe that we cooperate with the heavenly realm. We cooperate with the heavenly realm. And the Bible says that angels attach themselves to the words that come out. So I, to that degree, yes. But I don't have the wisdom to start telling angels what to do. <laughs> now, if I have a word from God, so I, my word is I don't believe we command angels. I believe we cooperate with the host of heaven. Now, that may be semantics. I'm not sure how somebody might look at that. But I, I don't want to get to heaven and find out I sent a bunch of angels on errands that they weren't meant to be doing anyway. They weren't for God. They're never going to do one thing outside of the will of God. Now, will God involve me in that process? Absolutely. Or me or you? Any Christian? Will God himself involve us in that and, and, and weave us into the formula so that a revelation is given to us and we know what to say and when we say it, the angels attach themselves to it? Absolutely, I believe that, 100%. But I don't believe there's a bunch of angels that have been assigned to me that are waiting for me to give them orders to tell them what to do. I don't believe that way. I believe that they are assigned to us and they cooperate with us with the mandate and the commission and the anointing that has been placed upon our life that as we pray and as we prophesy and as we decree, yes, those angels go with that decree. They go with that proclamation. They go with that anointing. They go with the Word of God released in and through us. But I don't, I don't you know, necessarily believe that I can just on my own wisdom tell an angel what they need to do or not need to do. I believe it has to flow from heaven first in and through us and we cooperate with the host of heaven. That's a brief answer. I hope that helps, Leslie. Thanks for asking and I appreciate your kindness. Um, here is one. Are all believers that have passed away in heaven, they go on to talk about certain belief system where some people believe that you don't go to heaven until the resurrection, all that. <coughs> So the question is, are all believers that have passed away in heaven now? The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, is that heaven? I believe so. <laughs> if you're, it doesn't matter where the Lord is. If you're with Him, that's heaven. The Bible is profoundly clear. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's what the Scripture says. And so, yes, if you, the moment you die, you are in, you're in a heavenly realm. You're in, you're, we are spiritual beings inside of an earthly tent. Okay? So when the earthly tent passes away, our spiritual being is going somewhere. It doesn't go into the grave, <laughs> that's for sure. It doesn't go lay with you in a casket. The spirit man is alive. He's never going to die. He has what? Eternal life. So the Bible, when you're a Christian, when you're a true born-again Christian, sealed into the kingdom by the Spirit of God, you have eternal life. So that spirit, that person on the inside just lays down this tent and he's taken to heaven. Absolutely. He stands in the presence of Almighty God to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Now, then you have the resurrection. That's a whole different thing. Where the bride of Christ is first, there's two resurrections. The resurrection at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with the time of the catching away of the bride and the resurrection at the end of the millennium. It's another whole teaching we won't go into there. But yes, I believe when you die, you are in the presence of God. A Christian is. You're standing in the presence of Almighty God and the hosts of heaven. That's what I believe. Absolutely. Uh, this one is from Trevor. Trevor, I'm going to postpone this one because I don't have the time to go into it tonight. But he asked about, my, he said someone else that was very, very kind, that follows our ministry, but had a little struggles with something I said about... Um, Genesis chapter 6 where it says the daughters of the, the sons of God saw the daughters of men and they cohabitated and produced fallen ones is what the Bible says. 
And I made the statement that his angels cohabitated with women and produced the, the fallen ones. I, and I know a lot of people struggle with that. I know that. I did a teaching called Days of Noah where I go into this very, very much in detail. So I would encourage you first, Trevor, to get that if you could. But just in a very brief nutshell, the Bible says, just to get to the, to the language of it, it says the Benai Elohim, the sons of God, the Benai Elohim, is actually, I think how you say it, the, the Benai Elohim saw the Benath Adam, the, the daughters of mankind. The sons of God saw the daughters of mankind. The Benai Elohim saw the Benath Adam, and they cohabitated, and they saw they were fair, and they cohabitated, and produced fallen ones. Now, the word has been translated in the Septuagint as giants, which is true, they were giants, but the real word there is fallen ones. <clears throat> Nephilim, they produced a hybrid race, and there was a teaching that was introduced, and, and that was the only thing that was taught up until the fifth century. <clears throat> I've done a lot of reading. Before I taught Days of Noah, I researched that extensively. And I did a lot of reading of, reading of rabbinical writings, Jewish writers, some that were believers and some that were not believers because they had a good understanding of Genesis 6 even if they were not necessarily Messianic. And so I did a lot of reading, wrote, read several books on the subject and some of the leading Jewish scholars absolutely say that can be none other than angels cohabitating with, with women producing a fallen race they turned out to be giants, had six fingers and six toes, and Goliath was among them, which was on the other side of the flood, by the way, which I address in the, in the series on the days of Noah. So they were fallen ones. They had no ability to be redeemed. And the angels, it says over in, in Jude and, and, and Peter, the angels that left their domain, they left the spiritual realm and came into the natural realm. I think that's the problem that many people have, that angels cannot cohabitate. Well, these watchers had the ability to. The watchers had the ability, you know, if you go over into the book of uh, Genesis, the Lord came with two angels, and these two angels ate, ate cow's meat. Abraham butchered a calf, made cornbread and buttermilk. And the Lord himself and two angels sat down and ate meat and, and ate cornbread. And these two men went into Sodom, and they were so much like men, the men of Sodom wanted to have sex with them. They were men. They had the ability to, to, to be like a man. So the, Peter says so. These angels left their spiritual domain and they violated God's law and came into the natural realm and cohabitated with women. That's what the, that's what the rabbis teach. That's what the, and even Messianic and, and uh, Orthodox. Now in the 5th century, a monk came up with the idea that it was the, the sons of Seth and the daughters of Cain cohabitated. And that was an accepted teaching for hundreds of years, believe it or not. But it has many flaws. Number one, the very language of the scripture, Benath Adam, uh, you know, daughters of mankind and the Benai Elohim. Benai Elohim is always a reference to created beings, always. And so there you have the, the problem there. You know, just Cain was not, a, was not a son of God. He was, or Seth, I should say, he was a son of Adam. Adam was a son of God. Adam was a Benai Elohim. The angels, it says in Job, were Benai Elohim, created of God. But man is always the son of man not the Son of God. We become the Son of God when we're regenerated. Of course, that's a different issue. But anyway, that's, that's the subject. I hope I gave you enough, Trevor, to work on. Uh, maybe get the series and listen to it and maybe do some reading and, it, and hopefully it will help you. So amen. Well, it's late. Lord, I thank you for every person that's watched tonight. I thank you for your revelation, Lord. I thank you for the hidden manna. I pray, Lord Jesus, that every one of us can eat of the hidden manna. Let every single one of us share in the hidden manner. Eat the revelation of Jesus Christ and be transformed, be changed, be filled with the fullness of God. I pray that you would create a hunger in these people to know the word like they've never known before. I believe that's part of the blessing of 2017. Truth is going to be the cornerstone. Truth, revealed truth, the quest for the undiluted revelation of Jesus Christ will be the banner of 2017 and follows. Grant that to your people, I ask, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, amen.